Sumter here with Halloween right around the corner. I'm checking out one of the scariest haunted houses in the area, Shocktoberfest, Prison of the Dead. Now, I hate being scared, but I know someone who is more of a wuss than I am, and that's my buddy Brian. So I brought him along with me, and we're going to check this out. Dude, I'm telling you right now, it's not going to be scary. Hold on. Wait. Oh. You cannot be doing this. Just wait. Just wait for what? Let's seriously. Let's just come sing. On. Just come with sing a Brian, song. You are seriously. Come on, we'll go to Walla. Oh, oh my God! Ah! 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 Okay. All right. I'm right. I love how you're holding me right now. <laughs> ah! Oh my gosh! What is? This? <laughs> okay. Hold on. Wait. Just time out. Okay. Ah! We, need, we gotta get out of here as fast as possible. We gotta go! Oh shit! Stop it! Go! 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 Come on! Go! 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 Oh, go, go! Oh my god! Oh, oh my god! Okay! Where? Oh my god! No! 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 We just have to anticipate where they're gonna be. Alright, see? Okay. I hate this so much. That's all right, everyone's there. Ah! Wait, yes. no, no, no! Okay. No more tunnels, none of this! Come on. Oh, heck! No, 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 I'm good. We're done. Come on, Brian, Brian, come on, No, Brian. we're done. Brian, come on, come on, come on. Are we covered by the church's liability policy? What? Yeah! Stay together. Come on. You okay? Are we lost? We've already been here. All right, we have light. We're good. We're good. Oh. No! 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 I'm good. No more. Is he behind us? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, no! oh my God! Oh God! Oh, what is that? What, is what that? am I? No, the strobe light is the worst ever. Close your eyes. Here, here. No, hold Seriously, on. I'm no, no, no. I'm serious. I'm what, serious. What are you, invincible against strobe lights or something? We're almost done. Are we? We're almost over the spider webs. Which way do we go? Get on the bus! I am not getting on the bus. Let's go! I am not getting on the bus. Don't touch. No touching. Oh. Oh. No touching. Come What's the right. safe word? Oh. 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 Come on. Here, get behind me. Oh. Finally! Finally. <laughs> I hear you. Oh gosh. Well, uh, t this was a great week at CCV. We great week at Surf Fest. Thank you all for serving and leading and donating. Truck or treat was amazing. Um, of course, where would we be without the Penn State game last night? 
You are losers. Bam. Anyway, it's my, my, my absolute favorite time of the year. Does anyone have anyone in their family that's like, I'm married, evidently I'm married to the captain of team. Oh no, don't turn the heater on till November. Does anybody have that in your family? Looking forward to the heater coming on uh, later in the week. So today I want to talk to, I want to talk about something that's actually scary. Because obviously I was faking that the whole time. <laughs> You couldn't see. It looked like you could see. I couldn't see in front of my face. Anyway, so what I want to do is I'm going to start out by asking you a question. Here's the question. What's the one thing that you're doing that you know is wrong, that you know God wants you to stop and you shouldn't be doing, but you can't stop? Everybody in this room has those things. What are those things? I want you to bring them up to the forefront of your mind right now. The question I have for you is why does this keep happening? You know, there are things that we know we should stop, and we want to stop, but we can't stop. We just keep doing them over and over and over again. These are things that I call persistent sins, sins that don't go away, that persist. And so what I want to do is I want to start out today by helping us to sort of frame uh, where we're going with the scriptures we're looking at. I want to take a little quiz, okay? And the quiz is going to start, they're going to be uh, two pictures over here, all right? And um, we're going to call this uh, Perkyoman Pam. We're in the Perkyoman Valley, right? So that's Perkyoman Pam, okay? And it, it, it looks like two different people. One on the left that got like a, in a zombie apocalypse that got shot. But this is actually the same person, Perkyoman Pam. Humor, humor me for a second. Perkyoman Pam is what well, Pam we would, that would be the prototypical woman that's in this area, right? The person on the left is Pam before she became a Christian. The person on the right is Pam after she became a Christian. The cross in the middle signifies her conversion experience. So non-Christian Pam before on the left, Christian Pam after on the right. You'll notice that for non-Christian Pam on the left, there was a big hole, as St. Augustine says, there was a hole that only God can fill in our lives. And um, you'll notice that the Christian Pam is now living on the right, and that hole is filled. She's complete as a person. Now, you're also going to notice now that there are X's over all of these pictures. Can you go to this? So there's non-Christian Pam on the left, Christian Pam on the right, and the X's are going to represent sins in Pam's life. The non-Christian Pam on the left has the same number of sins as the Pam does on the right, okay? So here's the quiz. Besides the fact that God now lives in the heart of Christian Pam on the right, what is the difference between non-Christian and Christian Pam? What's the difference? There is no difference. Other than God actually coming in as the Holy Spirit actually coming and living inside of her, nothing has changed. Nothing at all has changed. There's no difference. Someone comes out of the waters of baptism, and the same behaviors that you brought into the water are the same behaviors that you're going to bring out of the water. They're not magically going to stop. Now, a lot of you felt a sense of euphoria after you got baptized, and you stopped doing stuff for a while. But inevitably, just like all of us, you went back to doing the exact same things you did before you became a Christian, right? The exact same things. Now, what, I, what you have to understand is that Jesus wants to come in and clean your house. He wants to clean up and clean your space. Jesus does not like living where there's sin. Now, is there anybody that, out there that hates working in a cluttered workspace, all right? Raise your hand, okay? Because now point to the people who don't have their hand raised. <laughs> These are the problem. My buddy Matt, love Matt to death. We all love Matt Silver to death, one of my great longtime friends. The man has a messy workplace. <laughs> I love you, bro, 
But I go in there and I turn into Martha Stewart on cocaine, right? Give me this picture right here. I'm like, I'm cleaning this up. Let's do this. Book is going up. This is going there. This is going there. And the reality is our lives are an awful lot like that. When Jesus comes and lives, he's immediately like, ugh, ugh, this no, no, we're going to change this place. This is what theologians call sanctification, the process of the Holy Spirit helping us to become more and more like Jesus every day by getting rid of sin in our lives. The book of Ephesians talks about this process. You were taught with regard by, to your former way of life, your non-Christian Pam, to put off your old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, how many of you have tattoos here this morning? All right, guys in the room, do you have tattoos of women's name on your arms? Do we have anybody doing that? My friend Darren, my friend Darren uh, that led me to Christ, his dad, um, had a Sally really big on his arm. And that was great, except he was married to Connie. And, uh, <laughs> and I was like, so, Sally, what is the deal with Sally? And uh, Darren said, Dad, tell him the story. Tell him what happened. And, and, and he's like, oh, he was out drinking one time, and there was a girl that he liked, and that sort of thing. And then Darren's dad looked at him and, hey, and said, Darren, that man's dead. I can't tell you that story because that man's dead. Jesus loves you enough to accept you for who you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. And so the typical process of transformation looks something like this. Real quick, take a look at this. There are four levels of Christian growth. The first level is you get converted and there's no growth. All you did is you exchanged your final destination and now God is living inside of you. The second level is when someone starts attending a worship service on a regular basis, which is what Charles Duhigg would call the keystone habit of the Christian faith. You stop going to church, you think that you don't need it, two years from now, you're gonna be living the exact same life that you used to live. It's, it is the key, like the Pennsylvania is the keystone state that holds all of the other 13 colonies together, Church participation is the, the single uniting most important thing you can do for your spiritual journey and for your family. But still, even when you do that, there's slow growth because you're being exposed to God's word once a week and you're seeing Christian people once a week. That's not a lot. The third level would be when you start participating in daily Bible study and prayer. That's when you start to see some momentum. And the real good stuff, the real life change starts to happen when you commit to be with other Christians at a place at a certain time where now I'm going to reveal who I am and what I'm struggling with. When you get to that fourth level, things start to move at a very rapid, very rapid pace. But the problem is, how many of you have done all of those things and there are still sins that you wrestle with? Um, uh, a good friend of mine, a um, number of years, we're in a, we're in a conversation, and, uh, and this is a guy I looked up to. This is a, uh, a mentor of sorts, um, someone that you would look to, and you're like, now this Christian man is someone I need to model my life after, and he just told me. He, he doesn't go to this church anymore. You, you never know. He said, my... Um, my marriage is an awful lot like that Julia Roberts movie, Sleeping with the Enemy. Do you remember that movie? It was like way ago, it was 1991, where she's married to a verbally abusive husband, and she walks on eggshells. And he said, yeah, my marriage is kind of like that. My wife is absolutely petrified of me. This is a person that's been a Christian for years. Why does this keep happening? these persistent sins that we keep repeating over and over again. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 7, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do. And if I do not do what I want to do, I agree that the law is good, and as it is, it's no longer I myself who do it, but it's sin that's living in me. 
For I know the good itself, that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, and notice this phrase, my sinful nature. The sinful nature, okay, is the part of us that the New International Version translates this Greek word, sarkos, flesh, the sinful nature. It's the part of us that ruled the roost before we became Christians, and it's still in control after we become Christians. And we have to beat it into submission. It is the reason you keep doing the things you know you don't want to do. It says, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. For I, um, I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do. This I keep doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's the sin that's living um, that, in me that does it. So I find this law at work, this principle at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me, for in my inner being I delight in God's law. I really want to obey God. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work in me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, a number of years ago, we had a cat named Gracie that has since gone to hell. It, um, <laughs> great cat, it was mean. We have a very sweet cat, uh, Mac. Matt's the sweetest cat ever. And, uh, but when Gracie was here, like we just had the cat, and then we brought in a very sweet but dumb dog, and we brought it into the house, but the cat was in charge of the dog. The dog was more powerful. The dog, the dog was smarter in every regard, but the cat ruled the house. It was the saddest thing you would ever see. This cat just bullying this bigger dog around all of the time. That's the sinful nature. It's the part of us that we don't realize is very, very small that can be overpowered but on our mind, we don't realize it. So we keep repetitively doing over and over again the things that we don't want to do. What makes a sin a persistent sin? One is it's hidden. I want you to, I want you to remember this. Secrecy is the breeding ground for persistent sins. It's probably unlikely that the thing that you're wrestling with is, some, is something that good trusted Christian friends know about. Number two, it's naturally occurring. Like it piggybacks your personality. Um, what your natural God-given tendency, whether you use the, the DISC test or the Myers-Briggs or whatever personality, your natural tendency for the way you choose to behave and like to live your life, Persistent sins will sort of piggyback onto that. I'll be talking to someone, because I, I study personality types through the Myers-Briggs, and I'll just say, you know, this is just a guess, but do you, do you really wrestle with, do you wrestle with panic attacks? I'll say anxiety, like is, is anxiety his thing, or, you know, um, or, or persistent negativity, you know, on and on and on, and they'll say, well, how did you know that? And I'm like, it's because I'm a prophet of the living God. I mean... <laughs> No, it's just your personality type. I mean, anyone can read about it. And persistent sins will piggyback those things. The other thing that, uh, that's an aspect of, pers of persistent sins, they're parentally accentuated. Parents can play an unmistakable role in preparing us to live a godly life or not preparing us to handle sin in our lives. I think the luckiest pe people in this congregation are not... The wealthy, the educated, the attractive, the socially advantaged people in this room. But it was the young boys and girls who were given the greatest gift of all, who grew up in a relationship and in a household with godly parents. That is an amazing advantage in life, particularly when it comes to overcoming persistent sins. Now, the big thing, and why we wanted to talk about this today, is that persistent sins are satanically attacked. We've talked about this before. Satan's intent is want to hurt God. He cannot hurt an all-powerful God. So if I want to hurt you, 
the easiest way to do that is to hurt your kids. You want to hurt me, you hurt my kids. You know what I'm saying? That, 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 and that's what God, when, that's when God truly, his heart hurt, is that when he sees us going through a tremendous amount of pain and struggle, and that's, so that's why Satan will attack those. So how do we deal with persistent sins? Number one, and this is contrary to what the vast majority of you grew up experiencing church as, but you need to share your struggle with a trusted Christian friend. Here's my question. Is there someone other than your spouse, and it's important you can do this with your spouse too, but is there someone that knows right now the true condition of your soul? Who knows what you're wrestling with, the persistent sins that you keep committing over and over again? And do you have a safe place, a safe relationship to where you can share what's going on and you know it's going to go to the grave? The moment you share your struggle with someone else, it's not a secret anymore. That's when, that's when the temptation is broken in half, literally. Literally. James 5.16 says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Some of you are like, you know what, I don't have time to be a part of a group because I'm busy. And what in essence you are saying is, I am not going to prioritize cultiv cultivating relationships with a few other Christians so that we can do life together and that we can be the safe environment to where God can actually work out holiness and sanctification in our lives. You show me someone who doesn't take the time to develop authentic Christian community and I will show you someone who is racked with persistent sins because all of us deal with them. The only way you're going to get rid of them and deal with them is that you're going to have to do it together with someone. So who's that person for you? Here's a second one. I want you to explore the root causes of this sin with your trusted Christian friend. Um, last Sunday, uh, I was in a rush, and so I was like a madman trying to get ready for church and taking a shower and that sort of thing. So... I left the door cracked to the bedroom, um, mainly because I didn't want to steam up the bathroom mirror for my wife, because I'm a great husband. So, so Lisa yells out from the other side, she yells, don't leave the door open. I'm like, why? Because I'm in the shower. Why? She said, because someone can see. And I said, you do know that it's virtually impossible for someone to go from the outside of the house, looking in through the window, all the way through the bedroom, all the way through the bathroom, into the shower, and see me shower. She said, I don't know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so sure. So she started joking. She said, you never know, there could be someone out there right now. And I said, you listen, so think of what someone would have to do to take the risk of climbing up a tree waiting in the tree for hours just in the off chance of having a high-powered video camera or a telescopic lens, telescopic lens just to get a picture and be willing to risk going to prison. She was joking. She said, well, it could happen. And I said, I got to be honest. I'm kind of flattered by the idea. <laughs> you never know. Someone's willing to risk prison to get pictures to the masses of all of this goodness? <laughs> Who am I to deny that, right? Now anyway, so, so this, this idea of, of, of lust. So let me just pause and say, um, this is not a male issue, this is not a female issue. This is an issue of deep longing. This lust is about absence, not about possession. Lust is about what you don't have. It's not about what you're trying to get. Okay? So you're in relationships in this church, and it's a, it's a guy, it's a gal issue, okay? 
You know, Jesus, Jesus says, you know, if someone's struggling with lust, they ought to cut off their hand and pull out their eye and that sort of thing. He's not being literal. He's saying that you ought to take extreme measures. Well, if you're dealing with lust, the issue is, what is absent in your life that is causing a man or a woman in a perfectly good relationship, married to a very attractive person, that person is willing to meet their needs, wants to pursue a relationship, in what logical sense would it be that you would long then to have a relationship with someone else? Like, dude, you hit the jackpot. What, what are you doing? It's all about what you don't have. It's about the emptiness that you have. And so when we're talking about exploring root causes of this sin with a trusted friend, you know, I have a, I have a, a, a friend that, um, accountability partner and shares and where, what websites did you go to and that sort of thing. And you can do that all day long. You can go get protective software and all that kind of stuff. But until you start asking the question, what did I miss when I was growing up? And how do I go about to the process of understanding that, grieving for what I missed, forgiving and receiving a sense of wholeness, that attraction to something else is not going to go away. And these prohibitive measures of accountability partners and stuff like that won't, 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 won't even make a dent in it. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, this is a persistent sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. I Meaning it's going to take some time. You're going to have to dig in there. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. So my question is, everyone in this room deals with persistent sins. Who is the actual live human being that you have a safe relationship with, that you can talk about this stuff with, and be able to explore why, what's the root cause of this behavior and how do I address that? And then the third thing is, give your friend permission to conduct surprise inspections. I have a friend that installed software in all of his mobile devices and home and that sort of thing, and without his knowledge, will send me um, uh, updates on all the websites that he visits. Do you feel comfortable doing that? Every social media thing you did, everywhere you did. Um, I had friends who um, said, uh, you have permission to go into my refrigerator and into uh, my closets and look for any form of alcohol at any time. You, you can come and do that. What particular issue are you struggling with? And what kind of accountability do you need? Ecclesiastes 4, 9, 12 says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Maybe that's for you, that's you and your anger. Maybe that's you and your, your bitterness. Maybe it's Narcotics, maybe it's, what is it? Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands, you, that other person in God, is not quickly broken. Let's pray. God, we bring our brokenness to you. We bring our shame to you. We bring our guilt to you. We bring our powerlessness to you all of us in community, all of us in common, all of us sinful, all of us seeking for you to change us from the inside out. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help open up doors for genuine Christian friendships. God, help us to look around at the people we're surrounded with and if the sum total of those people is not reflective of the kind of person we need to be Help us to break off those friendships. 
God, help us to guard our hearts. God, help, God, help us to guard our minds. God, help us to not grow comfortable coddling these pet sins of ours, but God, help exercise them from our lives. God, for the marriages that are being torn apart, God, I pray that you would exercise those demons. For the anxiety and the pain and the destruction, the sense of being trapped, God, I pray that you would exercise those problems. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit right now would powerfully grab a hold of all of us, shake us, cleanse us, empower us in your spirit to live lives that are holy and honorable for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. For more practical resources to help you and your family, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com. Thank you.